for the recording. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to our chair for today, who is Simon Tysost. He is the Movement and Advocacy Lead at We All. He's an incredible being. He's based in Mexico right now, <laughs> despite his background picture. Um, but I'll hand over to you, Simon, to take it away and lead the conversation for today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tobile. The, the background is to remind me of Mexico City, which is actually one of the few green spaces around Mexico City. But um, I'm now based in Merida, which is very green and a lot of nature reserves around here. But big welcome, everyone. Um, and a real privilege for me to chair this um, provocatively titled talk about why your life depends on restructuring the economy. And we have um, really, we're, we're really privileged to have distinguished health experts from the Planetary Health Alliance. We have Dr. Courtney Howard and Dr. Sam Myers. Welcome to you both, uh, Sam and Courtney. We'll, we'll give you, I'll give you a bit more on their bios in, in a minute, but welcome to, to you all. It's quite, a, quite an audience and we really interest you. We really appreciate your interest in, in this topic. Um, so just as a just as an intro, I mentioned that you know, both both Courtney and Sam come from the Planetary Health Alliance, and this is an alliance of over 350 universities, NGOs, research institutes, and, and government entities from around the world, um, committed to understanding and addressing the global environmental change and its health impacts. And I think. Safe to say they are leaders in positioning the field of planetary health and, and, and looking at the impacts of human disruptions to the Earth's natural systems on, on human health and on all life on Earth. Um, and I'm pleased to say that they are members of the, of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And at the same time, we are members of the Planetary Health Alliance. And, and we come together in this alliance um, of alliances uh, around this understanding of the need for a, a fundamental shift in, in mindsets and in the economic structures that have brought us to um, a series of tipping points in, in our planetary health. So that just as a, sort of, as a preamble, who are our speakers? Um, so we have, and I have quite long bios as a really <laughs> interesting and long life experiences, or despite their young age. Um, so just just quickly, I'll, I'll put into the, the chat some of the some of the links on, on the bio so you can follow up more on, on both uh, Courtney and Sam. Just to say Courtney's now in the in the UK, uh, doing a master's in public policy at the Blackvenick School of Government at the Oxford University. Um, and she has led research um, on a whole series of issues from menstrual cups, health impacts of wildfires, uh, policy and advocacy on active transport, eco-anxiety. Um, she was the first woman to be president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and um, is part of the founding board of the Global Climate and Health Alliance. Um, and Importantly, uh, when we talk about well-being, uh, when not doing a deep literature review or seeing patients in the emergency room, Dr. Howard can uh, can be often found enjoying the great outdoors, dancing with her two daughters. Um, I don't know how you, how you have time for that, Courtney, but um, anyway, I'll pop a link to that in in the in the chat. Uh, welcome to you, uh, Courtney, and and uh, Sam, uh, Dr. Samuel Myers. Um, he's the founding director of the Planetary Health Alliance and principal research scientist on planetary health at Harvard University Center for the Environment. And a lot of research on climate change, human health impacts of large scale anthropogenic environmental change, including climate change, land use change, and the deterioration of, of ecosystem services. Um, and just uh, to um, ensure that there's more to that, I, I've just been informed that, that Sam also has two daughters and enjoys cooking and dancing and also cross-country skiing with, with them both. So welcome you, welcome to, to you both. Um, 
And some of you might be asking, so why are health experts coming to talk about to us about the economy? And, and well, I hope you'll quickly see the connections between human health and, and planetary health and, and our anthropocentric economic systems. But um, we've asked uh, Sam and Courtney to give us a kind of diagnosis and treatment of our planetary health and why this perspective is so connected to our economic systems. Um, and we'll give the floor to Sam and Courtney for that. That'd be the first part of the agenda. And then we're gonna ask Amanda Janu, uh, Wheels Economic Policy Lead, to give a first kind of quick reaction and response from an economist's perspective, which I hope will lead us to a further conversation to help us think about the links between planetary health and, and a wellbeing economy. And then we'll, we'll open it up for a conversation, comments uh, from the audience, uh, any questions. Um, and, and please do also um, use the, the chat to register any comments or questions that you might have during the, during the talk. Um, so that's, I'll just pop the, the sort of the, the order of play for the agenda in the chat. Um, and uh, with that, um, over to you both, um, Sam and Courtney. Welcome and welcome everyone. Thank you, uh, Simon. Um, I think the way we have this set up is I'm going to start. So um, let me see if I can share my slides. It looks like that's working. Um, so yeah, wonderful to get to be here with all of you. And, um, you know, this journey for me over the last 30 years has been about this sort of um, ever expanding idea of what it means to be a healthcare worker um, to the point where um, the planet has sort of become our patient um, and we're forming these new alliances and recognizing that there's very little in the way we live around the world that isn't relevant to thinking about um, whether or not we're going to have a livable future. And so we've been very excited with the Planetary Health Alliance to um, partner uh, with the Wellbeing Economies Alliance. And so this talk is kind of a first uh, instantiation of that partnership and um, exploration of the sort of spaces between um, our communities. So we're really excited to have that um, conversation with you. Um, quickly, uh, planetary health itself um, is both a sort of scientific field that's emerged over the last seven years or so and a uh, social movement um, focused on understanding and addressing the human health uh, impacts of our own transformation of our natural systems. And, you know, at its most basic, I would argue that um, planetary health emerges out of recognition that the way we're living collectively is just no longer compatible with a livable future for ourselves or the rest of life on earth. And so I think that's you know, th th this need to sort of restructure the way we're living is, is where we start to interface with the community thinking about restructuring the economy. We find ourselves in what Stefan and then colleagues have called the great acceleration, where for most of human history, you know, our consumption patterns have been relatively modest. And then really starting around 1900, this gentle rise and around 1950, this very steep increase in our total consumption patterns, whether you're talking about you know, appropriation of fresh water or proliferation of cars and trucks or production and use of synthetic fertilizers, paper and plastic production, they all look pretty similar. And not surprisingly, if you look at the impacts we're having on our natural systems, they also have this sort of almost exponential increase starting around 1950, whether you're looking at loss of biodiversity or exploitation of fisheries or addition of uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or loss of tropical and temperate forests. And, you know, fundamentally, the reason that all of these, these graphs look so similar is that they're underlain by these two really fundamental trends that you're all going to be familiar with. One is 
uh, the rise in the human population, which again was pretty steady for most of human history, starting to rise around 1900, and then this steep acceleration in the number of people who share the planet with us, at the same time that per capita GDP and the sort of goods and services that we're asking the planet to provide for us has been growing even more steeply. And so when you multiply the, those two trends times each other, we're, we're in the middle of this really almost vertical curve of rise of total world um, GDP. And so in that context, it, it, there's just been this enormous ballooning of humanity's total sort of ecological footprint to the point where it's really hard to overstate the impacts that we're having just in the last several decades on our planet's natural system. So we use about 40% of terrestrial land surface uh, for croplands and pasture, about half the accessible fresh water to mostly to irrigate our crops. Uh, we're fishing 90% of monitored fisheries at or well beyond maximum sustainable limits. We've cut down around half the tropical and temperate forests on the planet, dammed over 60% of its rivers. That number is on its way to about 92% in the next couple decades. Um, suffering from this growing problem of air, water, and soil pollution at a global scale. As you know, we're disrupting the global climate system. And all of these ways that we're transforming the natural world are driving species extinct at about a thousand times the baseline rate. We've already lost about two-thirds of the birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes from a population size perspective uh, that used to share the planet with us. And about a million species are facing extinction. So this is a snapshot of just this extraordinary ecological footprint in this moment where it's ballooning at a rate that we've never seen before. And the core premise of the field of planetary health is that the scale of our collective activity exceeds our planet's capacities to absorb the waste that we're producing or to provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, our own activities sort of collectively are transforming not only the climate system, but driving global scale pollution, driving the sixth mass extinction of life on earth, changing biogeochemical cycles, changing land use and land cover, and driving scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land. And that all of these biophysical changes that are being driven by our own activities are interacting with each other in complex ways that fundamentally affect these core conditions for human health and well being the quality and quantity of food that we produce, the quality of air we breathe, our exposure to infectious diseases, our exposure to extreme weather events even the habitability of many places that we live. And so we're seeing growing burdens of disease all around the world across every dimension of health from nutrition to infectious disease, non-communicable diseases, mental health, displacement and conflict. And so essentially the way we're living and the transformation of our natural life support systems as a result of the way we're living is coming back to become a primary driver for the burden of disease that we're experiencing and that we worry that will increase going forward. And a couple of very quick examples from my own research. One is showing that as we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, when we grow the staple food crops that we depend on for nutrition, when we grow them at higher levels of CO2, like the ones we expect by the middle of this century, we find that they lose some of their nutritional value. And in fact, when we've studied the impacts for populations all around the world, we find that these changes in the nutrient content of the food that we eat are likely to push around 150 to 200 million people into new risk of deficiencies of things like iron and zinc and protein, which are very, very important from a human health standpoint, in addition to putting about a billion people at increased risk for deficiencies who already are experiencing them today. Another quick example is a paper we published in December in which we showed that the loss of wild pollinators as part of this broad sort of insect apocalypse that you've probably heard about um, is affecting our ability to produce enough fruits, vegetables, and nuts, and that we depend on those types of foods to prevent diseases like heart disease, 
strokes, certain cancers, and diabetes. And when we look at what's, what's the impact of having insufficient populations of wild pollinators on our farms around the world, we find that we're already experiencing about half a million deaths every year from those diseases because of reduced intake of the foods that would protect us from them. So those are just a couple of um, very quick examples of how changing biophysical conditions will affect nutritional outcomes around the world. And then, of course, there's a whole host of, of these other kinds of environmental change, which are all happening simultaneously, which are affecting the quality and quantity of food that we can produce. And if we imagine that's just one dimension of health, but each of the other dimensions of health have equally sort of complex stories to tell about how changing biophysical conditions in response to our own activities are affecting the burden of disease from these whole domains of health. It also has to be said that there are enormous sort of social justice dimensions to this conversation. So by and large, the people who are most benefiting from the activities that are transforming our natural life support systems are categorically different from the people who are bearing the greatest burden from transformed systems. So the poorest people in the world, people of color, indigenous peoples, future generations, non-human beings tend to be disproportionately impacted by the transformation of nature. So the core message that's coming out of the field of planetary health is that this earth crisis that we've all been sort of increasingly aware of has actually been morphing into a global health and humanitarian crisis. And so this sort of fundamental insight that we can't stay on the trajectory that we're on and still safeguard a livable future for our kids or for other species. And that sort of takes us back to this diagram where if we think, okay, so the way we're living and our consumption patterns and technologies and the size of our population is transforming nature, which is driving this growing burden of disease, then on the solution side, we're going to have to think about how we do things very, very differently across every sector, whether it's food systems, energy systems, built environment, manufacturing, to shrink that ecological footprint and try to achieve what we've been calling the great transition, a shift in how we live. And I think that's where I'm gonna stop and uh, let Courtney pick up the thread. So thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. And, uh, you know, it's just such a joy to be uh, doing this with you. I'm just uh, gonna go back and see, I'm not seeing my screen to share for some reason right now which is, oh, there it is. Um, and it's uh, lovely to see uh, some of my uh, good friends on the call. Are you seeing the uh, slideshow there? Yes. yes, we are. Perfect. So I'm coming to you right now from Oxford, uh, but I usually am an emergency physician in Yellow Knives Dene territory, the traditional territory of the North Slave Métis and uh, that is where I have actually learned um, probably as much about planetary health as I have from uh, good friends like Sam and people at the Lancet, et cetera. It was where I first learned about the ecological crisis. So I was a freshly trained emergency physician. I trained at McGill and UBC. I wanted to work for Doctors Without Borders. And they said, if you wanna work for us, you have to go north. You have to go up to where there are no MRI machines. You need to work with less resources, diverse populations. Uh, so I did, I booked a locum uh, up in Inuvik and I happened to pick a book about climate change up on my way up there, mostly because I felt like I was an adult now and I ought to be a responsible adult and learn about responsible adult things. And I was very alarmed by the time I was partway into the book. I had not learned anything about uh, ecological crises, but I had learned how to recognize an emergency. And I also learned how to do a literature review. So I essentially got off the plane, sat down on the, at that time, snail-paced uh, internet in the Inuvik um, hospital, and ended up looking on PubMed and finding the Lancet Commission's first uh, commission on climate change and health, which said that climate change is the greatest health threat of the 21st century. Now, this was in 2009. And 
this had not been in my curricula. And I was pretty angry because I felt as though I'd given up my 20s to learn about emergencies and somehow they missed the biggest one. Um, and actually, I saw that uh, Kathy Wabnitz is on the call. She's, uh, as a medical student learner, she was very, very active in uh, helping to increase awareness of this in, in medical school. Sarah Walpole also joining similarly. And so there's ended up having to be a huge push within medicine to get this into medical curricula. And in fact, I, I just came uh, from the International Conference on Academic Medicine last week, where we finally launched a declaration on planetary health that has been supported by the World Medical Association, most of the medical schools in Canada. But when you do curriculum surveys of doctors right now in Canada and around the world, maybe about 20% of them have ever really learned about the health impacts of climate change, despite everything that uh, Sam just said. So we're, we're working at a moment where a lot of people in medicine don't know what they don't know about the health impacts of climate change. And meanwhile, um, I've been getting to know uh, the economics uh, sector as I've been here at Oxford, and I can see that a lot of the similar, a lot of similar factors are at play. People aren't necessarily, you know, they're they're well-meaning people. They want good things for society. However, um, there's a huge blind spot that they're not aware of. So I'm going to go through a little bit of, of the journey we've had within medicine and some of the collaborations we've done with with economists and just start the conversation about you know, how can we work together from here to ensure a healthy future? So, you know, it turned out that I was learning about climate change and one of the ground zeros of climate change. Anubic is already three degrees Celsius warmer than it was when an 80 year old elder was born. That's the Mackenzie River uh, down there just freezing up. It's known uh, as the De Cho Big River. And you can imagine that three degrees Celsius is a big deal. Uh, the difference between water you can walk on and water you can't walk on. And so that has consequences for the transport of building supplies, for food provision. Uh, the cheapest and healthiest food here is food that is hunted and trapped and fished. And so you can imagine that's a lot more dangerous to get to your traditional trap line if you're about to potentially go through the ice. And so there's consequences for mental health, cultural sharing practices, food security, and trauma. And so my patients already knew a lot about the health impacts of climate change much more uh, than the doctors I was working with. And in fact, it's been the, my patients many times um, as I've been trying to get this into uh, more mainstream medical curricula, et cetera, who have just said to me, keep going doc. So what this has meant is I've had to redefine for myself my vision of health. I thought it happened within the hospital, but really the entire thing has been reframed. And I now understand that everything depends on stable ecological underpinnings and the ecological determinants of health, things like soil, water, climate, et cetera. And that when those are stable, we get to build a social and an economic system that gives rise to what we talk about as the social and structural determinants of health, things like income, housing, et cetera. And when that's going really well, we get to build, staff, and supply the incredibly complex structures where I go to work when I'm working as an emergency doctor. And although you know you require a lot of focus to spend as much time as is required to become an emergency physician, and I think that lends itself to believing that that work in the hospital is all important. That work, and I'm still very proud of that work, is only um, really attributable, only about 20% of overall health status is attributable to what we do in healthcare. The rest of it um, is as a result of all of these determinants. And as you can see, our very ability to provide care in the hospitals um, depends on stability and the rest of the system. So when you look at that in terms of climate change, as our ecological foundation becomes affected by things like extreme weather, habitat and diversity loss, and we see increased presentations, heat-related illness, evacuation and trauma-related PTSD from wildfires, et cetera, worsening air pollution, asthma, infections, nutrition, that is going to put more pressure on all of our systems. So we're gonna see changes and are seeing changes in the social and structural determinants of health, things like housing damage, threats to livelihood, reduced equity, and all of that puts more pressure on our healthcare system. So when we say that your health depends on restructuring the economy and we call for a great transition, what we're saying is, look, we want to be able to provide great healthcare from now and sustainably through for future generations. We want people to live lives that allow them to thrive. That doesn't all happen within the healthcare system. What that means is that every single person who contributes to every element on this diagram 
contributes to well-being and has the potential to be a planetary healer. So one thing I love about this frame is from what I've observed, it can provide additional meaning to people in their work. I actually was lucky to just present to the Parliamentary Climate Caucus last week in Ottawa, and we told MPs from across five parties, look, your work saves lives. And that's a totally different thing to say to someone and for someone to get up a reason for somebody to get up in the morning than to, you know, try to get more votes. I could see that they were moved by that. And I think that there's potential uh, for that to uh, motivate people across disciplines. So I was pulled into some of this work actually by an economist. His name is Doug Ritchie. He uh, lived at the end of a long highway in the north. And what you find with people from the north is there's a lot of time to think. So I walked in and Doug actually had my friend Ryan Miley's book on the social determinants of health on his coffee table. Now, this is a great book, but it's, you know, wasn't exactly uh, mass published. So I thought to myself, okay, what's this guy, you know, this is interesting. Why did he invite me over for coffee? He invited me over for coffee because he'd been trying to get a carbon price instituted in the Northwest Territories. And he realized he wasn't the right person to make the case for it. He was the person who had the tools, but he didn't have scientific training. And he felt a bit like a fraud and really awkward trying to say, hey, this is why we need it. So he'd seen me present and he said, why don't we make a one-two punch presentation? You go first, you talk about the health impacts of climate change. And as it happened, right, when everybody looked really sad and you know, rather desperate, then what would happen was I would say, and here's Doug. And Doug would come on and give the treatment of the carbon tax. And it actually really worked. So we did that in the North. Uh, we put it into the policy brief uh, for Canada, the Lancet Countdown. We got the Canadian Medical Association to pass uh, a motion of support for carbon pricing. And we worked with economists to do communications uh, products like this. So we would do a health rationale say, look, these are all the reasons we need to change because there's a lot of communications evidence that shows that across nations, across the political spectrum, people care and are more motivated to act with regards to climate change to protect health and to work on measures that have health co-benefits than via almost any other narrative frame. And um, a colleague of ours, Ed Maybach, works a lot on that after out of the George Mason Center for uh, Communication. So we were, you know, putting that communications research into action. And this worked. Um, we helped to make the case for Canada's national carbon price. We were interveners in all of the um, follow up court cases. And in fact, in the very final press conference, one NGO was asked to co-present with the minister and it was the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. So from that, I take that, you know, it was considered helpful. Um, also with regards to divestment, having the health voice say, hey, we need to do do no harm healthcare and we need to do no harm with our, our dollars from healthcare. That has allowed us to then stand on sort of a, an ethical footing when we call for net zero health systems and the Canadian medical system is divested, it's multi-billion dollar portfolio from fossil fuels. Now, I'd been very involved in this. I'd never participated in politics. And then the pandemic hit. And I thought to myself, well, we're about to spend a lot of money. And I want it to be spent in a way that both fixes COVID, fixes climate, and fixes um, any economic uh, issues that we have. And so I decided to run like very much at the last minute for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada. And you take a nerdy person, you give them the task of putting a platform together. I essentially just did a literature review into what constitutes well-being. I thought, what do people want at two, two in the morning in the emergency department? They want to be well. They want to be well. They want their children to be well. So let's take that as the thing we all want and let's see what adds up to that. And that's when I uh, started looking into the measurements that we use. I, I have done nowhere near as much research as Sam, but I have done some. And in fact, led the first randomized control trial comparing tampons to menstrual cups. And the amount of effort you put in as a researcher to determine your outcome variables is incredible. I had binders and binders of, you know, exactly how do you diagnose a urinary tract infection? Like, can you rely on people to do it themselves? What does this study say? What does this study say? So I had actually kind of assumed we'd taken that same approach with well-being. And so I had my GDP makes no sense moment, um, realizing that really GDP doesn't make sense as a measure of national well-being. And of course, many people on this call had this um, realization far before I did. For all of these reasons, it doesn't address inequities, it counts every expenditure, even disaster response as positive, et cetera, which led to 
me going looking and doing an ecological economics literature review in the middle of this uh, election campaign, which by the way, you're not supposed to do, you're supposed to be fundraising. So just there's a hot tip. Um, I came up, uh, the thing, the approach that made the most sense to me at the time was from New Zealand, where they're starting to work with both stocks and flows, so natural capital, social capital, et cetera, and have developed a quality of life framework. So I thought, okay, well, how can we incorporate a real planetary health frame into all of this? And I have to say that Kate Rigworth's uh, Donut Economics makes a lot of sense to me. I've now uh, been extremely lucky to get to know her while I've been here at Oxford. But I love the way this gives us a framework of taking a look at our social foundation, all the things or many of the things that uh, have been shown via evidence to contribute to well-being, and invites us to, to make sure that we provide those for people without exceeding those planetary boundaries that um, Sam was talking about. And so looking at what Canada, this is, uh, I believe the Canadian, um, actually, no, this is, this is the world's donut, we're, we're vastly exceeding, um, as you know, our planetary thresholds. And so how can we, as we move towards a set of measurements that makes sense, that allows us to measure what, man it, what matters, how can we start to work in ways that multi-solve, that allow us to decrease our carbon emissions at the same time as we improve our well-being? So some of the things we've done that, that I think have worked are to, advocate for the phase out of coal fired power. So using the health voice, we uh, were part of the commitments to accelerate a coal power phase out in Canada, which involved uh, Ontario, as well as the national phase out, as well as Canada's co-foundering of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, saying, hey, nobody wants to see kids showing up in the emergency department with asthma. We'll save lives, save, save visits, save money, decrease greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. So when you're looking between disciplines and you're looking across all of the planetary boundaries and really aiming to improve as many things as you can with every policy measure, you can start to do that. And that has uh, contributed to some of our work on uh, active transport. Uh, Eric Nobart was an emergency physician in Montreal who basically mapped all of the intersections where cyclists were getting struck and proposed an alternative map with the help of engineering uh, students, brought that map to the mayor of Montreal, and they actually are building a new cycling framework based on that, and he since repeated that study in uh, Quebec City as well as Vancouver. So this cycling reduces mortality, so reduces mortality, reduces air pollution, reduces traffic accidents. Uh, there are many things that we're making better with this. Elizabeth Lim's uh, nature prescription um, allows doctors to say, hey, I prescribe you two hours of nature a week. Here's a free pass uh, for people who have uh, less financial means to go to national parks. And this has been shown to increase well-being, decrease cortisol, and increase the uh, desire for young people to protect nature. So as we start to build this up, we see that we can reimagine the world in a way where we're making a lot of things better uh, with the same uh, policy measures. And if we weren't looking at it in that holistic fashion, we'd be missing a lot of the potential co-benefits. Plant-rich diets are similar. A uh, hero of mine, Dr. Uh, Jane Philpott, the family physician, ran for office, became minister of health, and led an evidence-based food guide process that resulted in an essentially a product that looks exactly the same as that from the Atlantic Commission. So we know that plant-rich diets decrease land footprint, decrease water footprint, decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and improve health. So if we start to measure what matters, we can start to target policy measures that work. We know that empowering women decreases mortality from natural disasters, as long as you have really ensured adequate education and access to um, uh, reproductive and sexual health measures. And this this really, you know, this is something that has to happen in high income countries too. This is something that happened only a couple of weeks ago. A couple of friends of mine have been uh, advocating for free birth control in uh, part of Canada for years and it finally came through. So these are some of the really practical things that we can do. Cooking with natural gas uh, increases asthma in children uh, in different people's houses. So we can advocate for a switch to electric burners, saving greenhouse gas emissions and improving health. And of course, health can also uh, call for a reduction in extraction. Organizing globally with the Global Climate and Health Alliance in partnership with the WHO. The WHO uh, signed on to the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which actually paved the way for some of the country sign-ons. And we know that that way 
some of our indigenous and racialized uh, community members who are often the people who are most affected by resource extraction, if we start to transition, will be less likely to have their neighborhood end up completely polluted and be more likely to be able to continue to live in a healthy way. So as we move forward, uh, this is the picture we're moving towards. And I'm very excited to converse further uh, to see how health can help make the case for a well-being economy and how we can help to then propose measures that solve more than one thing at once and lead us towards a healthy future. So really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Courtney. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, amazing. Uh, really, really helpful to have those graphics and uh, it gives us a, you know, a good picture. We can share this afterwards, so we'll share the recording and, and with those graphics so, so we can follow up afterwards. Um, and I think, you know, good to have both the, the pretty grim diagnosis, but also, you know, the more hopeful, positive uh, ways of actually addressing some of these problems and getting towards what we might call a the great transition that needs to replace the, the, the great acceleration. Um, so opening, start opening it up, but before we open up for a conversation uh, and comments from the audience, um, invite Amanda in to, to, to reflect and react to that, because it's very clear that this is all interconnected and, and, and that the economic systems are very much the drivers behind both the earth crisis and by extension, the, the health crisis. And, um, and it's a very it's very important to maintain that interconnected, almost transdisciplinary perspective. So, um, how about how do you see this from a from an economist perspective, Amanda? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Courtney and Sam. That was that was really phenomenal. Um, I must admit, also, I should say, like I've studied neoclassical economics, but I think. I very much went down a more heterodox economic and, and sort of political economy route. So I think sometimes still even nowadays, when we think about from an economic perspective, we we tend to think more of a neoclassical one where it is very much the sort of narrow understanding of the purpose of the economy as being about generating money. And then it's sort of the problem of society or government to sort of fix any of the other damages that were done in the process. And so I think the, the illustrations that you really beautifully outlined around the issues with, with focusing on GDP as a sort of aggregate index that is accounted for in monetary terms, often, even though with, the, I think, the last decades, we've seen a lot of governments and societies trying to elevate the social and the environmental considerations to the level of the economic there's still, you know, some confusion about the interrelationship between those three spheres of where they're trying to sort of look at the balance or trade-offs between them when in reality they're not commensurate, right? So the economy is a part of our society that's embedded within a larger ecosystem. And I think what was so beautifully articulated here is the shift, because since COVID, it's been very interesting, I think, from Wheel's perspective, to have us invited into much more public health spaces and environmental spaces, like more recognition of really the root causes around economic systems change. And, and so the WHO, for example, last year was developing this well-being economy initiative. And in those discussions, one of the things I sort of realized was that because we've held the economy as, as paramount for so long, they still felt the need to make the case for why health was good for the economy, right? And didn't quite feel like they could swap that burden of proof and start to evaluate the economy in terms of its contribution to our health. But now there's been this new initiative on the commercial determinants of health. And I think that this gets to what um, you both were alluding to and Sam, you were speaking about, right? Like how do we actually, by elevating the social and the environmental, start to be able to then look at what kind of manufacturing or production processes, right, are, are really genuinely going to help to regenerate or protect our natural world, what kind of business models are going to ensure more equitable distributions of like wealth and power and time, what kind of goods and services are, are genuinely contributing to the health and well-being of, of a life and what ones are, are negative so we can nourish those areas that need to grow whilst also hospicing, right? Um, and allowing those areas that are really detrimental um, to decline. And so this is a this is a shift, like I think a big mindset shift. And so I'm really grateful for you, you both um, really helping to, to promote and keep pushing that journey and hope you know that we're here to help in whatever way we can. 
Thanks so much, uh, Amanda. I mean, I think really, really important also, this is the sort of convergence of alliances of the connection between the new economy movement and well-being economy and, and the health sector more broadly, planetary health is really important. I think it's it's very clear from, from this. Um, and, and how important it is that the health sector and more broadly the planetary health you know, feel that, that the Planetary Health Alliance brings to this conversation is really important in terms of leveraging economic systems change, which is what we need, right? If the economic systems are behind all of this. And um, so with, with, with that, we're gonna open up. I think it's, it's time to open up. It's, we're, 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 we're running out of time a little bit. So um, open up for uh, any questions or comments or, or just to continue the conversation that um, you know, Sam, Courtney and, um, and Amanda have kind of prompted for us. Um, and if you can put your hands up, I can see Sam, Mark, Kathy, Guy, Yuselt, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that your name right. Um, we can go in that order. That's how it appears on my screen. So um, not, not any preference for gender on that. Um, Sam, sell us. Uh, many thanks, Simon. Um, Sam Sellers representing uh, U.S. Agency for International Development. Thanks so much for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I was at a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago that uh, Rockefeller Foundation and, and Welcome uh, co-hosted around climate and health philanthropy. And I wanted to ask um, both Sam and, and Courtney, given your expertise in, in this field and the, the need that both of you articulated for systems change, what some of the, the kinds of investments you uh, both believe need to be made that would catalyze the, the kinds of systems change that, that you articulate? We, we know what the problem is. We know where we want to go. But getting there is, is the hard part. What are the, the investments that are going to, to catalyze the kinds of change that we want to see? Over. Thank you. I can jump in and and then Courtney, I know has lots of ideas as well. Um, a couple of thoughts. I guess the first one is that I think that the climate health frame is actually a little bit too narrow. And so planetary health sort of recognizes that we're not only changing the climate system, but we're changing all the systems and that those interactions are really important. So like the work I showed you on pollinator declines, that's not really a climate phenomenon, that's a biodiversity phenomenon, or the work I showed you on rising CO2 on crop nutrients, that's actually not climate either, even though CO2 affects the climate system, but that's a direct effect of CO2 on plants. And so I would say that um, a broader frame that recognizes that we're impacting all our natural systems and those impacts are affecting every dimension of health is really important because if we don't get that part of the diagnosis right, then we'll say the treatment is just decarbonizing the energy system and that's actually not going to be enough. So we need to take the broader frame. The second thing I would say is it's very tempting to go straight to interventions that we can measure in terms of, you know, tons of carbon removed from the atmosphere or hectares preserved, um, but that we actually need a paradigm shift. And it's part of why we're excited about working with the Wellbeing Economies Alliance, because I think you all are about a similar need for a kind of narrative or paradigm shift. And that involves um, education, it involves movement building, it involves support of sort of backbone organizations that are integrating an understanding of these planetary health and well-being economies issues into the corridors of power and decision making. Um, and so I think that's a, a, a piece of the puzzle that is often not seen by um, philanthropies and is probably uh, important if we're really going to get to the kind of societal change that I think we probably need. Did you want to Thanks. add to that, Courtney? Yeah, it's along the lines of what Sam said. So I, during my spring break, I, I got asked to come speak at Harvard and then I ended up in Quebec City uh, speaking with doctors. And then I went to Ottawa and I uh, was at a national conference kind of uh, reviewing what had been done under the Canadian Institute of Health Research's um, environment and health arm. And I kept, I was sitting at tables and I'd been sitting at tables with with doctors at the previous meeting and the scientists 
they just kept saying, we need to get this into policy. Everybody was endorsing advocacy. But really, you know, I've done advocacy wrong many times. Like it was a learning curve. And to do it right, you know, I'm about 14 years into this now. You need to know the basic science evidence base. And then you need to know the behavioral change evidence base. And then you need to know the communications evidence base. And then you need to have, you know, somebody who's a good visual designer uh, who's willing to get you your slides quickly if you need them. You need to have public speaking training. You need to have a secretariat who's going to take care of things when, you know, as a doctor, I do six shifts in a row and I just can't answer my email. Who's going to be setting up meetings? You need to have people teaching you how to do a pitch. You need to be having uh, somebody figuring out how to get a lobbying meeting with decision makers. And so I was sitting there with these scientists who were very, very frustrated that their work wasn't being represented in policy, knowing that we have no structures to facilitate that work in Canada. Um, nobody, and, and so what we're proposing, who knows, <laughs> is an institute in Canada that draws from research from our three main research bodies, which are health, basic sciences, and, and behavioral and social sciences, and provides a secretariat to then get that into policy um, in service of a well-being economy. Uh, we've developed a, a quality of life framework in Canada that's now part of the budgeting process, and we led an open letter uh, with doctors, including the Canadian, Canadian Medical Association, et cetera, last year. So there's a high degree of consensus that we need that. And right now we need investments to help us work between silos so that we can take the information that we've got and move it into the political realm to get things done. Okay, thanks Courtney. So what, what we'll do now in order to get those that, that have asked to uh, want to ask questions, just take the next two or three questions and then respond rather than respond to each one. I don't think we'll have time for that. So Mark, and then Kathy, uh, then let's see if we have time, Guy, uh, and then um, there's a question in the chat also about how do we, what will it take to counter the vicious pushback by industrial lobbies wanting to and trying to defend the status quo. Um, so there's, there's something to bear in mind there. And also some useful links on systems change uh, ideas in, in the chat. So let's go quickly to Mark and please keep, keep the questions short um, or comments short and Mark, Kathy and Guy. Hi there, thanks so much for a brilliant uh, presentation. Um, it, I want to encourage people to try and enjoy these really important uh, uh, meetings. And one way you can do is you can time how long it takes someone to say capitalism or colonialism uh, within the meeting, because th that's always the, the elephant in the room that people t t seem not to want to name. Um, and the trouble is with the strategy of trying to be more effective at um, winning over policy is the fact that we know that policy has been captured the, by by the the industrial lobby, by the by the you know ag agricultural lobby, etc. So my argument is that we need to be building alternatives to that. So I'm in the Andreas Baum, how to blow up a pipeline a model of why do we keep doing the same thing when we know it's ineffective? Can we not have a different paradigm shift to a different strategy? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Kathy. Thank you very much. I'm actually Michael, Michael Foss, uh, speaking from Germany, from the Center for Planetary Health Policy. And I'm sitting here having dinner with my team, which is great. Thank you for this event. It's amazing and very inspirational. Um, um, what Courtney said really, really resonate with me. Um, having the GDP moment, um, that the GDP doesn't work moment, it really resonates with me. And I would like to turn it into a research question. What are the moments for medical professionals or um, health professionals when they have exactly this moment? When do we see the economic not working for us or in favor for us to providing care or in the sense of public health? And I think this would be greatly for a mapping exercise to build this as a database to then also approach um, um, people working in the, um, in the economic field and economic policy. The German government is currently thinking about moving past and beyond the GDP model, also having invited 
um, the state, uh, the head of state from Bhutan. So there is space in policy making for this, but I think we need to prepare a little bit more. And I'm very happy to learn from you um, as well. So I'm trying to flip this into a research question for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Thanks. Um, I'm on Vancouver Island on, in British Columbia, and I've been working for the last seven years writing a book on the economics of kindness. So I've been really deep into economics. And I'm also 25 years working in the climate action realm. And I was hoping for some much more substantial stuff. So changing GDP measurement is great, but it changes nothing around the structure of the economy. Um, other countries have started already, like Wales and Scotland. In particular, like just to pick out three pieces, if we change the way central banking operates, the, the $30 trillion that's been used in quantitative easing could have been spent on climate solutions and affordable housing solutions. Second example is that every econ economic model discounts the future by 2%. They assume that the future doesn't matter as much as the present because they'll be more productive, they'll be more this, that, the other. So we should have a negative discounting model for the future because they know the future will be worse. And the third little point is that all economic models that are used in governments and government departments to to test and check on climate policies are passed through neoclassical economic models, which cannot measure long-term costs. So the very models we used have to be changed. And there's about 30 more things I'd say if I had time, but um, hi Courtney, and um, I'll let you go, thanks. Thanks Guy. So with quite a lot on the, on, on the economy there and on, on systems change. Um, so do you want to uh, come back and sort of, Time for a last reflection. I think it's going to have to be uh, Sam and um, Courtney and Amanda. Also, if you want to uh, say a few final words, um, over to you. Courtney, why don't you start this time? Sure. So those were very interesting um, reflections and comments um, with regards to um, the political system being captured by the industrial lobby. And, and I like the comment about the commercial determinants of health as well. We actually discussed that um, at a couple of the conferences. And, and the, the reality is that right now, we don't have structures really, um, or very many of them um, that are able to build the kind of power that is required to, for instance, uh, match the five visits to the fossil fuel uh, lobby is having with our uh, Department of the Environment um, pretty much every single day. Like usually they're out lobbying NGOs are better able to get a visit by about five to one. We, we That takes people to change that ratio. We're not funding that. Uh, universities tend to um, incentivize publications. It's not the same thing as incentivizing policy change. Um, it's quite difficult to fund peri-academic um, change making. And I, I think we need to do that. Guy, um, my, my, uh, my approach to this and I've now worked with uh, economists, urban planners, uh, uh, nutritionists, et cetera. As a physician, my job, and I treat this as being an emergency doctor, in the eMERGE, I need to be able to diagnose something, do the first three steps and know who to call. This is how we, quote unquote, this is how we really operate each one of us from our true academic um, place of understanding. So I am very aware of what you just said, but I'm not an economist. So what I will do in other presentations is make the case I've said, and then hand over to an economist to make those uh, suggestions because they're the person who really should be. And, you know, when we're doing multidisciplinary work, those are the kinds of um, areas where we have to be very careful um, because it's one of the ways that we maintain legitimacy and trust. And we know that it's when we have trust that we're better able to influence discussions. And with that, with Kathy, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Let's do that study. Sounds good. So handing over to Sam. Yeah, no, thanks, Courtney. Um, I know we're almost out of time. Um, I guess the one thing that I don't think we've talked a lot about, um, and I totally agree that we need to think a lot about movement building and, and how we build more power. I don't know another response to the power of entrenched special interests. And, and so what are the best ways to actually do movement building and social organizing and build power in contention around those issues? But the other thing is that 
you know, there is an enormously rich landscape of solutions across every single domain that we've been talking about, whether it's food systems, energy systems, built environment, you know, circular economy. There's a lot we know how to do. And so one question I have for all of you is how, you know, are there, are there simpler policies uh, that would catalyze that shift towards things like precision agriculture that you know is consistent with sustainable intensification or what we're already seeing in renewable energy where prices are coming down and it's competing with fossil fuels or you know how to get um protein fermentation as a substitute for industrial animal agriculture you know the, the, where we have really great solutions where there are already business models where people are making money doing this um, but what we need is sort of capital flows and uh, a sort of enlightened policy environment from governments to really encourage that. And so the businesses that are consistent with the great transition being lifted up. And I'd love to see, you know, work from your community. I'm sure there is work that I just don't know enough about, but I think that's an important part of this conversation as well. Thanks so much, Sam. Well, I, I think we're running out of time, so I, I'll have to let uh, Amanda comment at another time, but really great to, to, to have this, this conversation. And really, really great to see this convergence of alliances, if you like, of the fields of planetary health and, and, and well-being economies. I think it's very clear that of the links, the important links between them. Um, you know, I think uh, when we look at how you, we, you know, the challenges ahead in terms of bringing, bringing about systemic, more parad paradigmatic change, it, it will require action on all different levels. So some of the practical praxis levels that uh, Courtney has been speaking to, but also clearly the, the ideas and beliefs. So this convergence of, of, uh, of how the economic systems is tied to our planetary health is gonna be a really key shift in, in, in terms of the mindset. Um, so, so really appreciate you, Sam and Courtney, bringing that perspective to this conversation. Um, and as you said, as you said, uh, Sam, solutions surround us. So let's build on them, and let's continue to build this movement um, for a, a for a systemic change towards the well-being of, of people and planet. Um, thanks so much for your interest. We had we I think we had almost a record crowd today, so uh, it was good to good to have to see that interest. And to be continued, we'll share the we'll share the recording and look out for the next talk. Um, look out for the events coming up. There's a big one on the in in Europe in mid May on on uh, Beyond Growth Summit. A lot of our colleagues and members are engaged in that. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the next talk. Thank you, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everybody. That was amazing. Thank you.